The 1991 eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines' Luzon Volcanic Arc was the second largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century, behind only the 1912 eruption of Novarupta in Alaska. Eruptive activity began on April 2 as a series of phreatic explosions from a fissure that opened on the north side of Mount Pinatubo. Seismographs were set up and began monitoring the volcano for earthquakes. In late May, the number of seismic events under the volcano fluctuated from day to day. Beginning June 6, a swarm of progressively shallower earthquakes accompanied by inflationary tilt on the upper east flank of the mountain, culminated in the extrusion of a small lava dome. On June 12, the volcano's first spectacular eruption sent an ash column 19 kilometers into the atmosphere. Additional explosions occurred overnight and the morning of June 13. Seismic activity during this period became intense. When even more highly gas-charged magma reached Pinatubo's surface on June 15, the volcano exploded, sending an ash cloud 40 kilometers 25 miles into the atmosphere. Volcanic ash and pumice blanketed the countryside. Huge pyroclastic flows roared down the flanks of Pinatubo, filling once deep valleys with fresh volcanic deposits as much as 200 meters 660 feet thick. The eruption removed so much magma and rock from beneath the volcano that the summit collapsed to form a small caldera 2.5 kilometers 1.6 miles across. Fine ash from the eruption fell as far away as the Indian Ocean and satellites tracked the ash cloud as it traveled several times around the globe. At least 16 commercial jets inadvertently flew through the drifting ash cloud, sustaining about $100 million in damage. With the ashfall came darkness and the sounds of lahars rumbling down nearby river valleys. Several smaller lahars washed through the Clark Air Base, flowing across the base in enormously powerful sheets, slamming into buildings and scattering cars. Nearly every bridge within 30 kilometers of Mount Pinatubo was destroyed. Several lowland towns were flooded or partially buried in mud. More than 840 people were killed from the collapse of roofs under wet heavy ash and several more were injured. Rain continued to create hazards over the next several years, as the volcanic deposits were remobilized into secondary mudflows. Damage to bridges, irrigation canal systems, roads, cropland, and urban areas occurred in the wake of each significant rainfall. Many more people were affected for much longer by rain-induced lahars than by the eruption itself. A small blast at 341 on June 12 marked the beginning of a new, more violent phase of the eruption. A few hours later the same day, massive blasts lasting about half an hour generated big eruption columns, which quickly reached heights of over 19 kilometers and which generated large pyroclastic surges extending up to 4 kilometers from the summit in some river valleys. Fourteen hours later, a 15-minute blast hurled volcanic matter to heights of 24 kilometers, friction in the uprushing ash column generated abundant volcanic lightning. A third large eruption began at 841 on June 13, after an intense swarm of small earthquakes over the previous two hours. It lasted about five minutes, and the eruption column once again reached 24 kilometers. After three hours of quiet, Seismic activity began, growing more and more intense over the next 24 hours, until a three-minute eruptive blast generated a 21 kilometers high eruption column at 1309 on June 14. Tephra fall from these four large eruptions was extensive to the southwest of the volcano. Two hours after the last of these four explosions, a series of eruptions began which lasted for the next 24 hours, and which saw the production of much larger pyroclastic flows and surges which traveled several kilometers down river valleys on the flanks of the volcano. Mount Pinatubo's colossal eruption seen from Japan's GMS for meteorological satellite. The final, climactic eruption of Mount Pinatubo began at 1342 on June 15. It caused numerous major earthquakes due to the collapse of the summit and the creation of a caldera 2.5 kilometers in diameter, reducing the peak from 1,745 m to 1,485 m. 
All the seismographs close to Clark Air Base had been rendered completely inoperative by 1430, mostly by supermassive pyroclastic surges. Intense atmospheric pressure variation was also recorded. On the same day, Typhoon Yunya, locally named Didding, struck the island, with its center passing about 75 kilometers north of the volcano. The typhoon rains mostly obscured the eruption, but measurements showed that ash was ejected to a height of 34 kilometers by the most violent phase of the eruption, which lasted about three hours. Pyroclastic surges poured from the summit, reaching as far as 16 kilometers away from their origin point. Typhoon rains and flooding, mixed with the ash deposits, caused a messy rain of mud and massive lahars. A reported 847 people were killed by the eruption, mostly by roofs collapsing under a load of accumulated volcanic matter, a hazard amplified by the simultaneous arrival of Typhoon Yunya. The evacuation in the days before the eruption certainly saved tens of thousands of lives, and has been hailed as a great success for volcanology and eruption prediction. After the eruption, about 500,000 people continued to live within 40 kilometers of the volcano, with population centers including the 150,000 in Angela City and 30,000 at Clark Freeport Zone. In total, 364 communities and 2.1 million people were affected by the eruption, with livelihoods and houses being damaged and destroyed. The United States Air Force initiated a massive airlift effort to evacuate American service members and their families from the two affected bases during and immediately following the eruption, named Operation Fiery Vigil. The first sea-based evacuations departed June 16 from Alava Wharf, Naval Base Subic Bay aboard USS Rodney M. Davis, USS Kurtz, and USS Arkansas, all of whom were in port or who had made port immediately after the initial plume of June 12. The Eta people were the hardest hit by the eruption. After the areas surrounding the volcano were declared safe, many Itas returned to their old villages only to find them destroyed by pyroclastic and lahar deposits. Some were able to return to their former way of life, but most moved instead to government-organized resettlement areas. Over a decade later, Mount Pinatubo and its surrounding area is now a beautiful sight to behold. Its once tragic and ashen gray backdrop has now become a picturesque mix of blues and greens that can be witnessed in Mount Pinatubo tours that straight operating in mid-2000s. Its majestic caldera or crater with massive alpine-like rock formations surrounds a luminous turquoise lake that can only be described as magical. Mount Pinatubo quickly became one of the most sought-after tourist spots near Manila, frequently flocked by hiking aficionados. Trekking Pinatubo offers you a once-in-a-lifetime private tour to hike the picturesque Mount Pinatubo and view the turquoise waters of the volcanic crater lake. Depart from Metro Manila at dawn and drive roughly two and a half hours north in an air-conditioned luxury minibus, here you will board a old 4x4 Filipino jeep and enjoy a thrilling drive across Crow Valley, a moon-like terrain, with vast ash fields and rocky rivers. On the way you will have the opportunity to stop at an Ida village for an additional cost and enjoy interacting with one of the oldest indigenous tribes in the Philippines. You will hike up towards the summit passing through sandy cliffs and up a single trail mountain path. The views of the crater lake are breathtaking and worth every minute of the trek. Relax, you have plenty of time, take in the incredible surroundings. Bask in the sun and enjoy the views of the lake before returning to Santa Juliana. Back at Santa Juliana, there is a stop at Alvin's place. You have the option of having a toilet break, shower, home-cooked food, refreshments and resting your weary legs. For food it is recommend you bring your own packed breakfast and drinks to keep you hydrated for the hike. After you have finished your hike you can stop at Alvin's place or a restaurant along the route for lunch. On our journey back to Manila you have the, the chance to visit Capas National Shrine. Here is the Mount Pinatubo full itinerary. This is a rough itinerary based on a weekday tour. On a Saturdays they will depart earlier. Times vary depending on traffic, how long clients take to do the hike and time spent at the Crater Lake. If clients decide to visit Capas National Shrine you will obviously return to Manila later. At 4.00 m, 
the tour company provides a private pickup from your house or hotel in Metro Manila. The drive in an air-conditioned minivan will take approximately 2.5 hours. You can have a quick stop along the way for a coffee break but you must remember that it is important that you arrive on time. At 6.30 to 7 o'clock a.m., once you have arrived at Pinatubo Spa Town, your driver will register your names with the local authorities and transfer you to a waiting 4x4 jeep to take you across Crow Valley. Please note that this can take some time so please be patient. There is an opportunity for a toilet break and it is safe to keep all your valuables locked inside the minivan. At 7.30 a.m., depart for Mount Pinatubo Crater Lake in an old 4x4 jeep. The journey across Crow Valley is bumpy, dusty, and without air conditioning or seat belts, but it is lots of fun and a great adventure. The terrain is moonlike with gray sands, small streams, and parched vegetation. You will pass by herds of cattle and locals eat a riding carabao on their way to work. At 8.30 a.m. After a rough one-hour ride across Crow Valley you will reach the start of the trekking point. The hike is roughly 5.5 kilometers, two hours walking, each way with a total ascent of 300 meters. The terrain is relatively flat until the last 20 minutes where you ascend to the rim of the crater lake. Please note that there is also an option for a shorter hike in the summer months when the riverbed is dry. The 4x4 jeeps will travel further up Crow Valley to a drop-off station. You will walk the last 20 to 30 minutes on a single trail to the Crater Lake. At 10.30 a.m. your first sighting of the Crater Lake is absolutely stunning. You will immediately notice the bright turquoise waters which are surrounded by the volcano's huge crater walls. Head down to the lake, relax and enjoy the sunshine. Unfortunately swimming is no longer allowed in the lake. At 11.30 a.m. begin trek back down the mountain and then start the 4x4 jeep trip back across Crow Valley. At 2.30 p.m. arrive back at the registry office at Santa Juliana. Begin the return journey back to Manila. We recommend an optional extra stop at Capas National Shrine. The Capas National Shrine is a memorial to the Filipino and American soldiers who died in Camp O'Donnell at the end of the Bataan Death March in World War II. It is a fitting end for a great day out. At 4.30 p.m. begin the return journey back to Manila. Top 5 Things to Know When Planning Your Mount Pinatubo Day Tour 1. If you're not sure how to organize a DIY MT Pinatubo Day Tour, Get a tour package with an accredited Pinatubo organizer. 2. Take note of the time and follow the itinerary as planned. According to the locals, there used to be a short trek, via the Skyway, where the 4x4 Jeep reaches a certain area that's near the base of the Pinatubo so hikers would just have to walk 1 km to continue the hike and get to the crater. 3. Pack light. Heavy backpacks do not just put burden on your shoulders but also sap your energy, therefore, packing light is a must. 4. For the ideal choice of footwear, hiking shoes or any comfortable rubber shoes with thick socks is way better than a pair of Crocs or sandals with no socks. 5. Bring a handy camera.